having me, you guys. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, I'm not familiar with this yeah. club. Future doctors, mm -hmm. is that what this is? Mm -hmm. Everyone wants to be a doctor for sure, or just exploring the opportunity, or padding their resume, or a little bit of everything? Mm -hmm. A wide range. A wide range. Got it. A lot of people. A lot of people. <laughs> um, I live not that far away, and my daughter will come here and uh, be here to this high school, and I've given a similar talk to other high schools, but I am an orthopedic surgeon, and I work out of the new Palomar Hospital in Escondido and Palmerado, which is right in Metro Bernardo, so not that far away. Has anyone ever seen an orthopedic surgeon as a patient before? Broken a bone, injured a tendon, ligaments? No one has ever seen an orthopedic surgeon. This is the boring safe crowd. You guys just study and play video games, no sports or anything? Not, uh, I do sports. I just haven't broken myself. Just haven't broken it yet. Yeah, it's a little bit yeah, more it's, yeah. That's a very important thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, what is an orthopedic surgeon? You can go ahead and hit the next one. Does anyone know what an orthopedic surgeon does? Thoughts? Yes. Operation regarding like bones and bone structure and like, bone replacement. Correct. So, bone, bone structure, bone replacement. Um, ortho is from Greek. Ortho means straight pedic, um, actually for children, so we used to straighten out little children's crooked bones. And now it incorporates both um, broken bones and torn ligaments, uh, muscles, but it has big parts. So mainly the skeletal system bones as well as the muscle system, including tendons. Um, you can hit the space bar again. So we see a lot of things. Back pain, parents help you clean out the garage, you get a sore back, you come see me. Uh, again. Um, shattered ankles, an injury, and one more. Um, mangled extremities, car accidents, motorcycle accidents, you see all these things. Um, you can hit the space bar again. So how do you become an orthopedic surgeon? So I do, I'm a surgeon, I operate, but I operate on maybe 10 to 15% of the patients that I see, I, maybe 30%. I, I, I take care of a lot of aches and pains with sitting with physical therapy and uh, medication, exercises, braces, casts, things that don't require surgery. Anyone know how you become an orthopedic surgeon? Because that's why you're in this club, right? Why you know in this space bar. So first of all, college, hopefully four years, sometimes they feel longer. Actually it took me you know, five years. Um, I I was studying philosophy and thought that's what I wanted to do, uh, something in the medical legal field or legal field, and uh, decided medicine the last minute. So I um, became a philosophy and biology double major and had to get all the prerequisites, so I was there a little bit longer. Um, at the space bar. Then after college, medical school, four years, there are some combined programs. You can be in both and three. They're pretty rare. But So this is once you leave here, we're already eight years out, and I'm still not working yet at that point. So space bar. Then you get a residency. Residency for orthopedics um, is five years. So the first year is called an internship and you do a lot of general things, cardiology, radiology, almost all of them related to orthopedics. Then five full years of being a, you're an MD at that point, but you're a junior resident learning how to do the ropes. You're operating, but someone's always watching you. And then almost all of us, space work, uh, do a fellowship, and that's a subspecialty. I did a fellowship in Los Angeles with a group called Curl and Joe Clinic where I am sports medicine sub-certified. So I took care for a year. I was the physician for a team called the Dodgers, the Lakers, the Kings, the Ducks, um, USC football. And I basically go to all the games and take care of their athletes in the training fields and the locker rooms and on the court. And so we learned to deal with the <clears throat> injuries, overuse injuries, big traumas, everything related to the specialty of sports. There's lots of fellowships. There's pediatrics, there's spine, there's foot and ankle, there's hand and wrist, there's shoulder, there's sports, which is mainly wrist and hip and knee. Um, there's lots of there's upper, or there's, sorry, there's uh, reconstruction, which is a lot of knee replacements and hip replacements. Um, so next, there is 14 years minimum 
training after high school. You guys are in a future job, you know there's a lot of work after high school, but this is probably the longest. The only one that's longer is some neurosurgery programs for seven years instead of five, and ours is six. And so there's one extra year where if you do neurosurgery, you can drop and do a year of research, which is pretty boring for some of that time. That's good. That's the only thing that's longer. On uh, next. So how do you do it? Um, how do you become, first of all, high school, this is what you're doing. You're starting in clubs, you're getting your resume bigger and better. You have to do well in high school, not necessarily number one in your class, but you just have to get into a, a good or decent college. College is where it's really important because college is going to be a lot more picky about getting into medical school. So you have to do well in college in order to get into a medical school, not necessarily the best in the nation, but you have to get into medical school. If you do have to be at the top of your class in medical school, at the top tier, not the top, but the top tier, in order to get into orthopedics, orthopedics is a pretty well sought after residency. And so once you get into medical school, you're going to become a doctor. You can really be quite lazy and do just fine. But if you want to do some of the more difficult residencies and fellowships, that's where you have to do quite well. And then during residency, that's five years, it becomes very personal that the, the pool of people who want to go to medical school is pretty big. The pool of people that do well in college and actually apply is smaller. The pool that actually get in is even smaller. Once you're in medical school, it's a pretty small group across the United States. The ones that want to go into orthopedics becomes even smaller. And now it becomes very personal by this level. And there's, you know, I was in a residency with five, I was in New York, there was five residents each year. And so all the, the bosses, the chief surgeons that we worked with, they really knew us. They were operating next to us at three in the morning. They see us if we up at five in the morning rounding and they, uh, they tell our personalities. And so they can then give us a personal recommendation or not. And so just doing well, then they can write a personal recommendation to get that fellowship, that one year of specialty training maybe 10 or 20 programs across the United States that they want to go to. And then you have to find a job afterwards. So next. So what's an average day? This was actually my day yesterday. I finished this late. Um, I got up early and worked out. That's just because I need some form of relief. Five a. I have four kids and I live not that far away. So I got up early, a little working out. 6 a.m. I go to rounds to the hospital. I mean, I have patients in the hospital who are there for a few days and I need to see them every day. So I go in, I push on their legs, see how they're feeling, and that takes roughly an hour by the time I get to the hospital and go around. I had surgery at 7.30 till noon, with about five different cases on patients, and then at 12 o'clock in the office, I started seeing patients. So these are patients that are new, coming to me with pain, or patients that I've operated on, making sure they're doing okay. So I saw those patients till five. I was on call at Palomar Hospital, a bigger hospital, so during patients, during surgery, I'm getting phone calls saying, you know, Mr. Smith was in a car accident, he has a broken ankle, and I said, okay, put him on ice, I'll see him at 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock when I'm done. So I kind of get this cue backed up of a bunch of <coughs> patients. So when I finished in the office, I then went up to the hospital and did surgery out there roughly until 11. Sometimes you get lucky and there's no surgery, sometimes you're there all night, depending, and got home, went to bed, and started the next day. But it's not always this busy, but it is. It's a very busy field. Um, and that's something to consider if you want to go into it next. So what's my average patient? That's sort of the beauty of orthopedics. You see patients brand new, newborn, one week, old. They can get hip dysplasia, uh, club feet. There's lots of things, brand new babies. All the way up to, I had a 112-year-old patient. I mean, the whole gamut in between, which is really nice. You can see it all. So we talked briefly about problems I see. Sports injuries, sort of, I, I see a collection of that because I'm sports trained, but I see a lot of general problems too, arthritis, wear and tear. Car accidents, work injuries, whether it's overuse or in New York where I trained, there was a lot of um, snow blowers and machinery where people would get their hands stuck in this and get mangled. Mutilated. Um, overuse injuries, we see a lot of CrossFit injuries and overuse. Birth defects, like I said, whether it's club feet or congenital dysplasias, cancers and tumors, as well as fall and various traumas. Um, you guys want to know what an average surgery was? Statistically, the most common surgery I do is a little tear of the meniscus in the knee, again, because I'm sports trained, or a ACL tear, where you tear your ligament. Next. 
Um, that we do arthroscopically, two little teeny poke holes to put you to sleep, put this hammer in there. It's basically like playing a video game. We just go in, we see this little teeny tear in here uh, through one camera, which I put a hole in, and then another cam another teeny hole, I have these micro scissors. It's basically like a swimming pool vacuum. It spins around about 3,000 RPMs, and I can turn on suction. I put this thing in and turn on suction, and everything around it comes into it, just gets ground up like garbage disposal. So I can go right up to that and just basically shave that torn part out. But that catches and locks and causes a lot of pain in the knee. We clean it up and get you back to your support next. Um, also, lots of non-operative things. Sometimes you have to take you to the, hot, to the operating room, but you have a broken, crooked wrist. We put it back and put you in the cast. One of the common things next. Um, Big traumas, you fall, you get a big broken hip, we can make a, or a broken femur, we can make a small incision, put giant rods and plates in there to fix it. This is some of the most exciting surgery, but it's never at an opportune time. You're never sitting there saying, hmm, I hope a fracture comes in and kind of an inopportune middle of the night, big trauma. Next. Um, you guys asked for specifics. You know, one of the nice things is that in my field, I have the ability to, um, do fun things with my hobby slash job as well. And one thing I do, even here in San Diego, is I'm one of the physicians for the US snowboard team, as well as for the US free ski team, which do the half pipes and the jumps and the Olympians. And so I travel with them all over the world, and I have some pictures of that. But this guy, um, one of the best snowboarders in the world, fell off a big jump and landed on his forearm and got what's called a bone form forearm fracture, where he broke the radius in the whole nut. So we had to take him back to surgery, or take him to surgery, put these plates and screws in there, which look quite big, but they're actually pretty low profile, not much sticks off. You can see the staples in the skin, this was taken right after surgery, and he's back to doing pork nine mixed twists, everything else, so next. Um, sometimes it's pretty dramatic trauma, or sort of saving, you asked if I saved lives, and there's not a lot of lives I saved, there's a trauma surgeon at the hospital who works on saving their heart and their blood and stuff like that. I kind of come in and save limbs and get people back to walking. And sometimes we have to put this external fixator, it's a big carbon fiber like an erector set that you put on the outside of the skin, holds everything more in the shape of the leg than it was when it came in. And then we do multiple surgeries, we operate on every few days or a few weeks as things go along. This particular guy that's over at Paladin Hospital, he was riding a motorcycle and a car hit the motorcycle, which is a very common injury. So yeah, these are some of the fun things I get to do. Um, take care of Lakers, Kings, Ducks, Dodgers, the uh, Angels. Um, now that is incredibly um, intense in terms of the time allotment, especially Dodger games are way up at Dodger Stadium and far away. The game itself can take three hours, it can take two hours to get there, you gotta wait an hour afterwards. It's just there's no money in it at all. You can't really make a living. And it's very high stress because these clients, these patients demand a lot. It's fun, it's nice to have on your resume, but there's not many people that do that in your whole career because it demands too much. Next. So I, I chose something that I enjoy more. I think this was in France uh, two years ago. They had an X Games um, in the Alps of France. This is the half pipe, and there's a guy that went down, so we're going to down there. But I go with the whole crew, I'm not alone. Um, guys who work for either X Games or for, I was the only guy for the US team, there's a Canadian team member and some other ones in there. So I have a family, a career, a life, so I kind of keep on traveling to just one or two events a year, but it's kind of fun. Next. Um, went to New Zealand, which is really exciting. They have snow, their southern hemisphere, so that's the only place where we can train as a US team in the summer. Um, next. They have half pipes, you have to bungee jump off these crazy big things, that's fun. Next. Um, we also went to Fiji, I take care of some of the professional surfers, next. So in summary, it's a lot of work for a big surgeon, it's very physical. You don't have to be super strong, we have very thin, dainty women who will do an outstanding job, and we have big, giant men who do a great job too. But it is a lot of work, a lot of time commitment. You can't just operate once or twice a month and be good at it have to be constantly doing it to keep up on what's new. We do change people's lives. I don't think I save a lot of lives, but I do help people get back to what they enjoy. That's probably the most exciting part of uh, my career. 
It's a great career, and if you're interested in it, then it requires putting your best work in starting now. Um, so that's a big overview of what I do. Um, I hope there are questions, but are there any specific questions you guys want to start off with? Okay. Um, what are some of the tools you use today? Like you showed us all of them, and yeah. uh, how have the tools changed? Like maybe in the past five years, just like since the field started. Yeah, great question. Believe it or not, even though I'm a surgeon, our whole field is based around trying not to operate. And so we've gotten a lot more into what's called biologics, and San Diego is a big place for that. So for instance, arthritis in the knee, which I didn't have a picture of, but the knee joint is basically covered in this thin layer of cartilage, right? You eat a chicken bone, at the end you get the little gristle, that's the cartilage. And that cartilage wears down. We're trying to get that to regenerate and grow. So, um, injections of composites or we can actually take a piece of your cartilage, grow it in a petri dish for about $60,000 and then take those cells and inject it back into the knee. Um, it sort of works. We also have some cytokines and some basically some biologics we can inject in there that can turn on a little factory to make cartilage. We just don't know how to turn it off yet or when to turn it off so it can create a little bit too much cartilage to grow. So, that's the, the most exciting and newest thing. In terms of actual tools that I've used, and instead of doing these big surgeries that they did in the past where they unzip your knee in this big incision, we're trying to do it through smaller and smaller. So um, when I was in training, we did a lot of navigation. Basically, you have this mini GPS machine. You open up the knee, quite small, and put this little mapping where you put a pin and put it all over the knee and the computer sitting right there next to you it makes a three-dimensional, a 3D model of the knee itself. Then the computer sort of thinks through and says, okay, you need a size four on the bottom and a size five on the top, and here's where you make your cut, and you hold your saw, and the computer will basically tell you where to go. This was really exciting, very, very expensive uh, tools that we used for about a year, and we all threw them away because it didn't, it didn't take into account and some people still use them, but you know, if you were like just on the computer, it would tell you to do this horrible cut, and it didn't make sense. But some people still made it cause and cause. So that's the future: more robotic, smaller incisions. But um, like you know, the picture of the car accident with the broken femur, we literally can fix the biggest bone in the body through an incision about an inch and a half long, which is kind of sexy. It's kind of cool. Um, other questions? Yeah. So you say you work with people um, coming through traumatic, like traumatic damage after they, uh, I mean, after they, they preserve them at like, like critical organs, how long is it till you come in and do operations on their, their bones to, to make sure things is like a couple hours later, a couple days later? Yeah, it depends on the injury. That's a good question. I was, um, I was surfing last week and I took some friends with me. And we, it was about 7 o'clock in the morning, really early for work, and I forgot that I was on a call that day. And call starts at 7 a.m. So I got out of the water about 7.20, um, the surgeon again, I didn't even know it was on a call. I go to change by the car, and my cell phone had about six pages on it, and I was like, ugh. And so I call it back, and it was one of the trauma surgeons, he's like, I've got this car accident, my hands are in his pelvis right now, he's bleeding out, I need you here. And so occasionally, that's pretty rare, you gotta come, you know, tighten down the pelvis if it's wide open to help someone survive. But we are not required to be in the hospital. I, I can have an hour and they really can get there and they're supposed to stabilize things and tell them. Almost all the things we do can wait. We do a lot of it that night just for convenience and helping them. A lot of what we see is older patients with hip fractures. We try and fix those within 24 hours. A lot of the smaller stuff, ankle fractures, ACL tears, we can have people wait a week or more. So it really depends on the injury, but about 90% of stuff we do can wait. Um, the emergent things are things that threaten the limb or an open fracture. If your bone's sticking out, you get surgery, you get surgery in about six hours. Other questions? Yes? Typically, how long are you in the operation? That's a good question. I have a pretty short attention span. Most of my surgeries don't last much more than an hour. Um, there are some that last four or five. You know, when you do spine training, sometimes that would be 
literally 18, 20 hour surgeries and I just get tired, bored, and I want to move on to something else. So most of my surgeries, quick arthroscopic, I mean that's a half an hour, 40 minute surgery now. That's me actually operating. It takes time to put the patient to sleep, wake the patient back up, um, put the bandage on, get them in recovery. I mean, so there's a process, I'm not just operating every 20 minutes, but it, the surgery itself, like we're trying to do less surgery, smaller incisions, we're also trying to keep the operative time as low as possible. Some of these big traumas, they can take a while. Uh, have this giant guy, almost 300 pounds, driving his kids out to one of the um, casinos to go, you know, Chang or one of these to go hang out at the hotel and do some um, laying by the pool. And they come around a corner and there was a semi that came head on. So this guy, big guy, just got smashed. Took him almost three hours just getting out of the car. He he broke both humerus, both femurs, both tibias, and his ankles, and a lot of them were open. And so I was there probably, you know, I had to cancel. Yesterday I got to stay in clinic and go at the end of the day. I had to cancel everything, drop everything, go over there. I was probably about 12 hours. And that's, that gets tiring. It's a little not very often. And I have a ton of colleagues, so lots of people I can call and come in to help if I had to have that. Another question? So, oh. yeah, I'm assuming, assuming that you've been some kind of like accident or like you've done some kind of dynamic movement and you like feel yourself like getting hurt or something happens uh -huh. but you don't know what happened because it's not like something you can actually see yes what would you do in that situation so you feel like something went wrong but you, you're walking you're doing okay is that what you mean uh yeah but it, yeah there's like a pain factor but you can't see so that's when you come see me and then i do an exam and i can tell if it's going to be critical or if it's just a common overuse or strain and then we use a lot of MRI. And MRI is incredibly sensitive at telling us if there's a real problem or if it's just information. And then based on the MRI, we kind of do cortisone injection, therapy, or surgery. But that's common even in ACL tear. You can tear with the main ligaments in the hand. It can be quite functional if you need surgery. Thank you guys so much for coming. No problem.